Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so very much for being reminded that we live in a world of unsaved people who actually go to two extremes. One is the shocking extreme of actually eating not just other human beings, but eating fetuses. Then, Father, for those who are the sophisticates, uh, more educated, uh, have more money, uh, the extreme of, of partying and just uh, doing their best to get busy with life so they can forget about God and their accountability to him. But Lord, thank you for the day that the conveyor belt, as Skip has said, stopped at our door and we were ready, ripe for the gospel, white unto harvest, and we trusted your son as our savior. From that time forward, life took on a new perspective. It doesn't for all. There are saved people who are carnal people, living like men, the Apostle Paul says, a reference to the world. But Lord, we ask that you will help us to differ ourselves from the wisdom of men on either extreme and even in the middle. Help us to find the wisdom of God to be sufficient for our lives. In the name of your Son, our Savior, amen. I had a little uh, thing here handed to me entitled, Holy Bloopers. This being Easter Sunday, we'll ask Mrs. Johnson to come forward and lay an egg on the altar. For those who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. Potluck supper, prayer and medication to follow. Announcement in the bulletin, don't let worry kill you off, let the church help. <laughs> yes. All right, we had some good thoughts in the opening of our service this morning with regard to the extremes of humanity. And uh, indeed, we are getting uh, polarized in two areas. On the one hand, people are becoming, as it were, more animalistic, without natural affection, don't care, just live for themselves and uh, enjoy the world uh, even if it means living in a ghetto, going to the dregs, the depths of depravity. There are others who, uh, who want uh, a better life, better quality of life. Uh, they're educated, living in industrialized countries, but still they don't want God. And so they do things that um, uh, enable them to forget about God and their responsibility to live for him. Now, the problem with either extreme and with all in the middle is that eventually there comes a time when life becomes disappointing, when life has turned its tables on you and you don't know where to turn. You don't want God, and I'm using this hypothetically, but yet you do want help. Where do you go? You go to a counselor. Uh, you go to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, some other type of counselor to help. You get involved either in individual or group therapies. You do everything that you possibly can to get information to help you uh, keep uh, from being depressed, um, uh, unsuccessful, uh, lackluster, uh, in your life. You want somebody to help you do something with your drug habit, with your drink habit, and so forth. And so, as a result, in industrialized countries, and especially in the United States of America, uh, the psychiatric profession has um, escalated to the point where there are thousands of these types of doctors, helpers, counselors, and multiplied millions of people going to them. It's a lucrative profession. And it's all because people want guidance, want direction, and want help over a problem. Now, might I say that in some cases, these doctors are helpful and legitimate. I would never say that a psychologist or a psychiatrist in every aspect of their help is wrong. That's not true. I would say this, however, that any philosophy and any science, to the extent that it denounces God, rejects God, and his solutions for life, 
is a false science. Now, I hope that uh, you understand what I'm saying. We go to medical doctors. Uh, we go to unsaved medical doctors. And we trust their opinion. We follow their instructions. And some of us do, you know, got, got to lose a little weight. Uh, got to get rid of the stress and all of this business in your life. Uh, and we understand what they're saying. They're there for us to help. But to the extent that someone like a psychologist or a psychiatrist or someone that goes internally, you talk about invasiveness, it's not just going in your body, it's getting in your mind. It's actually invading your soul with a viewpoint of life. You have to be careful because if they're unsaved, then sometimes the information they can be giving to you is information that will enable you to have the willpower to overcome what, what we call the conveyor belt uh, of, of, of history, as um, Skip Yoakum has said, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It is our contention that these people want this type of thing, get into this uh, um, uh, type of activity because they want to forget God. They want to ignore him. And they want somebody to help them uh, past that point of having to remember God. And then when they get in trouble, like getting stuck on uh, drugs, addicted to drugs, then they need help uh, uh, getting uh, uh, off of these things. Now, one of the problems then uh, is that of volitional responsibility. But what we're going to talk about today is something called nuthetic counseling. Is there a bona fide counseling? Yes. In the secular realm, yes. To the extent that some of these uh, counselors do not lead you to reject God and his solutions, it's fine. Every now and then people need to talk to someone. People need to get sorted out. They need to get reorganized, refocused. And it's good to talk to a friend, a pastor, a counselor with regard to this. A, uh, an extreme problem, okay, that's fine. However, God has so designed life that he makes us responsible personally and individually for our thinking, our lifestyle, and what we do. So we're going to see the concept of nuthetic counseling. It's something that is straight from the scriptures, straight from the Apostle Paul, and something you need to do, and, and, and uh, I need to do as well. Now, the first thing we have studied is the law of volitional responsibility. Verse 7 in Galatians 6. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You see... There's not a single one of us that is not going to stand and personally give account of himself before God. Now, what's going to happen is people are going to say, well, the devil made me do it, you know. Uh, well, the flesh made me do it. That's what the Apostle Paul was struggling with in Romans 7. I want to do one thing with my mind and the other thing with my flesh, and there's a constant struggle. So the flesh made me do it. God, I got an excuse. Adam's sin gave me the old sin. Next. The flesh made me do it. And uh, then the world made me do it. Uh, I was just following the crowd. Everybody was doing it, God. I, you, can't, you can't blame me. We, we don't want personal blame. But he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now that means too with regard to wisdom. If you spend your time in an attempt to acquire simply worldly or carnal wisdom, God, uh, the word causes the wisdom of men, and you live your life in the light of that, then you of the flesh, you, in your life, it's going to fall short someplace because God cannot allow the wisdom of men to win, be victorious, or override the wisdom of God. But he that sows to the Spirit, the words that I speak to you, said Jesus Christ, are spirit and life. The flesh does what? Profits nothing. So therefore, you have to understand that um, uh, you are responsible for gleaning spirituality in your life by way of the Word of God and the filling of the Holy Spirit. He that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. 
Now, this law of volitional responsibility is very, very important for all of us. We cannot talk about counseling without talking about, first of all, that God has given you a life, he has given you a mind, he has given you a volition, he has given you an opportunity to choose the route you're going and the philosophies that you're going to follow. It's either the wisdom of men or the wisdom of God. Now, as, um, as I said, we had two extremes brought to our attention this morning, very vividly, very good. Uh, there's probably none of us here, hopefully not, that would stoop so low as to ever eat another human being or a baby or a fetus. I mean, that is low, that is repulsive. On the other hand, however, how many of us would go to the extreme of uh, getting into this, this type of lifestyle where we get in trouble in one form or another, and instead of coming to the foot of the cross for the help of Jesus Christ in our lives, bypass that and seek worldly counselors to help us have self-esteem, feel good about ourselves, or kick some nasty habit that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God would do if only we would submit to the will of God. Now, that's why every one of us responsible for our own decisions. If you don't trust Christ, God holds you accountable for that. If you don't uh, 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 follow a, a faithful a pattern to the Word of God, God holds you accountable to that. And you can't blame someone else. Anna Russell says, I went to my psychiatrist to be psychoanalyzed to find out why I killed the cat and blacked my husband's eyes. He laid me on a downy couch to see what he could find. And here is what he dredged up from my dark subconscious mind. When I was one, my mommy hid my dolly in a trunk. And so it follows naturally, that's why I'm always drunk. When I was two, I saw my father kiss the maid that I despised. And that is why I suffer now from having to tell lies. At three, I had the feeling of ambivalence toward my brothers. And so it follows naturally that I poison all my lovers. But I am happy because now I've learned the lesson this has taught that everything I do that's wrong is someone else's fault, you see. And that is simply not the truth. Someone else in the Garden of Eden wanted Eve to do wrong, but Eve didn't have to succumb. She didn't have to make that choice. And Adam, nor you, nor I. So when we talk about volitional responsibility in this matter of, uh, of counseling, everybody wants to go to somebody who will tell them. And boy, the psychologist, secular psychologist and psychiatrist are good at this, that it's not your fault, you're really okay, because something happened to you in childhood is the reason you are the way you are now. And I want to tell you that is ridiculous. Every single one of us have, have had things to happen to us, injustices, uh, unfair situations. And does that mean that we can go out and shoot someone or rob a bank and the rest of it? That is not right. And, it's, and um, uh, so therefore, the law of res uh, volitional responsibility stands true. Okay, turn with me now to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. There is point two, therefore, what we call a common grace guarantee. Before we even were subject to the gospel, God the Holy Spirit made us aware of our responsibility to God. We have gone over and over this time and again with the doctrine of common grace. What common grace guarantees is that every individual, it doesn't matter where you are raised on this planet, every individual by means of creation, conscience, and then ultimately God the Holy Spirit comes to an understanding that there is a supreme being to whom they are accountable. Now, in John chapter 16, we're told that God the Holy Spirit is uh, one 
who is actually the one, and his ministry in this area is the same today. He strives with men regarding their accountability to the Father. Nevertheless, verse 7 says, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I go away, uh, I'll send him to you. When he has come, he will reprove the world. Now, here is why the world does what it does. It either comes to Christ, comes to the light, or hardens its heart, deafens its ears to the call of the Holy Spirit. It's his wooing ministry. He gives us the understanding. He helps us to perceive and says, you need a savior. You need to have a relationship with God. And man says, no, I don't want that. He rejects the light. He rejects God. And that's why it says in verse number eight, when he has come, he will convict the world. Now, it is our assertion that many people that are on the psychiatrist's couch and that are in group therapies are people who in all actuality have had God the Holy Spirit speaking to their heart and they don't want to listen. And they lay their head on their pillow and they hear thump, thump, the blood surging through their vessels in their ear knowing that their heart is beating and that that heart could go out and they could die in their sleep and go into a Christless eternity. And that is why they want to forget it either with drugs, either with drink, or, or even the more sophisticated things, the, the busyness of the world, the restlessness that we see. It is a rejection of common grace as to why the psychiatric profession is so popular today, why uh, pills are so popular. You know, you got, some people are too hyper and we've got, to, we've got to calm them down. Some people are depressed, we've got to elevate them. You know, so you've got uh, downers and uppers, depressants and, and uh, uh, the, the um, uh, elevating drugs that we have. But note what he reproves them of, of sin. You see, they want to have self-esteem knowing directly that the Holy Spirit is telling them they're a sinner. That they are rejected of God. And that, and that they, have no, they should have no self-esteem because before God they are worthless. God, uh, in, in the word of God, calls unbeliever trash. That's why he sends them to hell. Gehenna was the Jerusalem trash dump, and Gehenna is synonymous for hell. People who reject Christ, God says, look, I love you, I care about you, but if you're not going to trust Christ, then you're defective and worthless to me. Of sin of righteousness, because they, they all can only have self-righteousness at the best, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. If the best of the world, the prince of the world, is judged and condemned, then the rest of us, who are mere, merely the followers of the prince of the world, must ultimately face the judgment as well. If he's the best and cannot defeat Jesus Christ, we who are less than the best are not going to defeat him either. So, verse 13, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, that is why we have emphasized this point of the common grace guarantee. That everyone is given an understanding and the reason they are mentally or psychologically deficient is that inside of themselves they are struggling to reject the grace apparatus. And so therefore they have to do something else to enable them, to bolster their volition or to help them forget God. Now, Romans chapter one. This forgetting God business is a big mistake. Because, point number three, the greatest problem man has is what the Apostle Paul calls a reprobate mind. Uh, I, I remember uh, a guy saying one time, it's been several years back, I was witnessing uh, to him, and uh, he said, um, oh, he said, no, I'm not saved, I'm trusted in Christ, but I'm no reprobate now. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, and then he used the word infidel. I'm no infidel. I, I believe there's a God. Well, great, fine. 
The problem with that is he was having what is called a reprobate mind. Reprobate, and we'll read it here in verse number 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Now, I'm going to stop right there. What is a reprobate mind? A mind that is a docomos, we're going to see the word reprobate, it means disapproved. But the Apostle Paul tells us in the very first part of this uh, verse of Scripture what a disapproved mind is. A mind that doesn't want to retain God in its knowledge. That's a disapproved mind. Any science, any philosophy, any person who enables you to establish in your life a philosophy of evil, which is the best of life apart from God. You can kick the habit. You can get around this. You don't need God. Is a person who wants you, wants to help you forget God. And the more you ignore him, and the more you forget him, and the more you reject him, the more you become what? Disapproved the less knowledge of God you have in, in your soul, the more disapproved of God you are. That's why God says they have their understanding darkened. I don't want the light. I want to walk in darkness. And darkness is a mind without God. It is totally disapproved. Now, we should understand this, um, this Greek word, dokimos, here. We've, we've certainly quoted it enough. You say, Pastor, I have. I've quoted the Greek, dokimos. Well, no, you quoted the English, approved. Study to show yourself what? Dokimos. Approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, study means to fill your mind with God, with the word of truth. The word of, of, of truth, uh, the, uh, the Bible, is the mind of Christ. It's how he thinks. It's how he conducts his life. If we want to be like Christ, then we have to assume his mind. And uh, that is an approved mind, totally righteous in everything he has ever thought or will think, anything he has ever done. He is docomos, approved, stamp of approval, imprimatur. God the Father said, this is my son. I am well pleased in him. He hasn't thought one thought which, uh, of which I disapproved. However, unbelievers and even carnal believers can have a reprobate mind. That is our greatest problem. And um, that is why, again, as we point out, uh, the, the ministry of a church is, and I'm, I'm familiar with uh, the church that um, uh, was made mention of uh, this morning. I, I believe uh, uh, I am. But uh, they, they have their fitness centers. I believe they've got a full bowling alley in the basement. You know, uh, all the aerobics classes, cafes, restaurants, and so forth with their tens of thousands of people. But the problem is, is this. With all of that going on, there is not much orthodox or accurate Bible study. And you have to study to show yourself what? Approved by God. And if you don't study, you have a reprobate mind. I don't care if you're the member of the first church. I don't care what standing or status you have in that church and community. You're disapproved of God. It takes the study of the word and conformity to it in order to be approved. Now, that's why it says, God gave them over, therefore, last part of the verse, to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness. You will remember our concept of unrighteousness. What is righteousness? Right thinking, leading to right actions. What you do is secondary to what you think. It all started from what you thought, your attitude, your disposition, which leads to what you do. That is secondary. Religion today focuses on works, not what you think. God always focuses on what you think first because it's your thinking that leads to your action. Therefore, a disapproved mind is unrighteous. That's why we go to an unsaved counselor to tell us how to get self-esteem apart from God. Well, that's not, that's not right. That's unrighteous. How we can leave God out of our lives and still be successful. Well, that's not right. 
that's improper. You see, verse number 18 of chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, that spirituality. The words that I speak to you are spirit. God is spirit. And unrighteousness, that is truth of men. Men want uh, to be able not to think about their spirituality, not to think about the absolute truths of God. So they do what? Who suppress, hold the truth, verse 18, in unrighteousness. How do they suppress the truth? Unrighteousness. What is that? By perpetuating or promoting a different type of thought than God. That's how they do it. You don't have to think like God. Well, then, I want to think something. Well, here is what you think. Here is the 12 points to a successful uh, uh, kicking the, the drink habit, you know. Here, here's what you do. Well, you say, well, Pastor, um, doesn't that particular program say that you have to admit that there is a God? And I say, yeah. The Jehovah's Witnesses admit that there is a God and reject the deity of Christ. Are they saved? The uh, Muslims admit that there is a God and yet reject Jesus Christ. Are, are they saved? Admit it. The devils know that there is a God and tremble. But what the devils do not do is bow down at the feet of Jesus Christ and say, you be my savior and you be the Lord of my life. You see? And any other type of thinking is unrighteous to the extent that it suppresses real truth. It suppresses spiritual accountability. Okay. Now, uh, let's look at some things here. Uh, turning to chapter 8. In the book of Romans. A reprobate mind is a mind that is disapproved of God. The word reprobate means non-conforming, non-standard, unfit, not sanctioned, disqualified, worthless, rejected. All right? Now, there are a couple of other things that the Apostle Paul uses to describe a reprobate mind. He uses the word carnal. Sarks. The word sarks is flesh. Uh, you remember um, I said last week that emotions, apart from the filling of the Holy Spirit, feelings, uh, apart from the filling of the Holy Spirit, is the old sin nature. And it comes right from this Greek word sarks, originating from or literally of the flesh. It is a feeling of the flesh. Now, please don't misunderstand. Let me stop here. There is a spectrum of feelings that we have. There are legitimate feelings that we have as human beings. Feelings of love for family and friends. Uh, mourning for, for lost loved ones and that sort of thing. There are legitimate feelings that we can have that are not necessarily sinful. But it is to feel good about myself apart from God. That is sarks. That's fleshly. Um, it is to go to the extreme uh, in, in the realm of feelings in order to have self-esteem, self-promotion, and the like, and not have to include God in my life. That is the philosophy of evil, and that's what Paul calls carnal or sarks of the flesh. Note Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That's what they give their attention to. And we, we only, uh, uh, again, our view, and I, I've uh, insisted on this for years, our view is limited to simply the carousers. That's not true. It can be a moral person who goes to a, to a church that doesn't teach the truth about the gospel to get pride in themselves. Well, I'm not like those carousers. I'm not like those ghetto people. Look how great I am. Well, what is that? That's still of the flesh, the pride of life. It's still fleshly. It still doesn't glorify God. You're trying to be self-righteous and work your way to heaven. That's fleshly wisdom. They mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things that, uh, uh, that are spiritual. That's why spiritually minded people are the only ones who glorify God. And uh, 
people who, who simply reject Bible teaching churches, reject their right pastor teacher, forget about that. They'll never make it. It's impossible. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For the carnal mind, that is the mind that originates from the flesh, that is in it to feel good, in it to have the material world please them, the physical world please them, whether it's, whether it's uh, sex to speaking in tongues, that's carnality, it's of the flesh. Are, the, are enemies of God. They're not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can they be. So they that are in the flesh, they that are of the flesh, cannot please God. Carnality is involved in a disapproved mind. It is emphasizing the feelings of the flesh as opposed to the realities of, of the spirit and emphasizing those. Okay, let's, let's move on here. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and I've got to quit. Whoa. Verse 19. This goes along with carnality or a reprobate mind. They're enemies of the cross of Christ, verse 18, whose end is destruction, whose God is their emotion. Their feelings are their God. They're in it for the feeling. Now again, you have to understand, there are legitimate feelings, as a, even as an unsaved human being, that are not wrong. God gave us emotions, and there are certain feelings we can have, and we are not sinners as such. We're, we're not rejecting God as such. We're human. We have them. We must deal with them. But the problem is, is that the flesh wants to feel and whether it's the pride of life, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, uh, whether it's uh, having more than someone else, being better than someone else, being top dog, whatever it is, the flesh wants to feel. And if it doesn't feel good, then it's going to seek out other flesh who are going to pat them on the back and say, there, there, you're okay. Uh, it's your mom's fault the way that you are. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's your environment. That's, it, you know, it's because you were raised in a ghetto. That, that's why you are what you are today. You're a product of your environment, not of your volition. Uh, someone else caused all of this. You, you're not accountable, and that is nonsense. Uh, these people want to make other people feel good. That's why uh, people gravitate to a church where feelings are paramount either with the positive thinking, I'm okay, you're okay deal, or the charismatics, it's all flesh. All right? Note, here is a characteristic of the reprobate mind, whose glory is in their shame. The flesh profits nothing. They glory in the flesh. That's, that's shameful. For a mere feeling, you sell out to God. For the pride of life, you sell out. Sell your soul. Who mind earthly things. They have their, their attention, their focus on the things that originate from sarks or from the flesh. Okay, we're going to have to uh, feed the flesh now. <laughs> this is a different kind of flesh, you understand. There's flesh and then there's flesh. Flesh one, two, four, five. Okay, you are dismissed.